This is number 38 in a series of 80 Old Testament lectures. Continuing on with our study of the life of David, some seven days after Nathan tells David that he was the man, and David confesses his sin, and later on we'll study that when we get into the Psalms. There are two Psalms connected with the sin of Bathsheba and uh, Uriah, and one is Psalm 32, and the other is Psalm 51. These are called the penitential psalms, and we'll get into them later. Some seven days later, now the baby, da- the, the baby dies. And uh, in verse 24, in spite of God's judgment, we do see his mercy. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And uh, so here we have now the birth of, and the first mention, a very important man in the Bible called Solomon, certainly not the greatest man that ever lived. He did not have the spiritual heart that David had, but he was the wisest man that ever lived, and in any list of who's who, Solomon's name would have to appear. All right, uh, let's see, that's pretty well it for chapter 12. In chapter 13, installment number two comes due. Remember, God said you'll pay fourfold for your sin. And uh, he'd paid the first installment, the the baby had died. And now there is incest in his own home. One of his sons, whose name was uh, Amnon, had a half-sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon fell in love, actually, Love had nothing to do with that, I guess. It was more like lust. Lusted after his half-sister, uh, Tamar. And uh, so he entices her. He pretended like he's sick. And he entices her to come in to take care of him. And then he grabs her and he forces her to lie with him and he rapes her. And here we have now in chapter 13, verse 14. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice. She said, Please don't do this. Well, he did. But being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Installment number two, incest. And now in the next verse we find the beginning of installment number three. Then Ammon hated her exceedingly, and so he wouldn't even... Uh, decided that he didn't want to marry her, didn't have want anything to do with her now. And often this is what happened. Lust turns into hatred. And uh, in verse 23, we find out, let's see, just a second. In verse 20, rather, we find the beginning of installment number three, and this is murder. Because Tamar's full brother, Ammon was her half-brother, her full brother was Absalom. And here is the first mention of Absalom in the scripture, apart from his birth some time ago. And he becomes a very important uh, character in Bible history also. And he develops a hatred in his heart for Ammon, his half-brother, because of what Ammon did to his full sister, Tamar. And uh, so he plans and plots revenge. And two years later, it took him two years, but two years later, it happened. And in chapter 13, verse 29, we have part three that is come to pass, and this is murder. And the servants of Absalom did unto Ammon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man got up upon his mule and fled. We have the death of a child, we have the rape of a sister, and now the murder of a brother, part three. Absalom now leaves, and he flees into the desert, and he stays with his pagan grandfather for three years. And uh, finally, through a set of circumstances that we won't go into now, uh, the king allows Absalom to come back into Jerusalem. And when he comes in, he returns to the city, but he has refused an audience with his father for two years. I think the Schofield Bible, the old Schofield Bible, I have a new one before me here and it doesn't say this, but I think the old Schofield points out something very important. It says that sometimes as we look at the life of Absalom, that some Christians conclude uh, erroneously that uh, his problem was that David was too indulgent, let him get away with too much. But 
Uh, actually, it was the uh, it was the other way around. David was too harsh on occasion. David should have stepped in and tried to clear up some of these things before it happened. And now he allows him to come back to the city. But uh, for two years, he refuses to even speak to him. In verse 24 of chapter 14, And the king said, Let him, uh, King, do you know, uh, David, that your own son Absalom is in the city? Well, let him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. I don't even want to talk with him. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. So he refused to see his own son. And this would lead to a problem. And the problem was in verse 25, But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. For from the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head there was no blemish in him. Well, after a while, after two years, and then David had to be really be pushed into this, Number one, I mean, uh, into giving an, an audience with his son. Number one, Joab, uh, the general, demands, because Joab wanted, uh, he realized this, there was a bad morale problem here among the troops and among the people. He said, now listen, the least thing, uh, the least you can do is to see that boy. And uh, beside that, uh, Absalom is putting a little pressure on him too. He uh, burned up a cornfield. And he's causing some problems and becoming a juvenile delinquent almost. And David said, all right, I'll see him. Verse 33, So Joab came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, the king, that is to say, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. So they made up now. But you know, uh, Old Testament Bible history might have been changed had the king made up before this. He should have stepped in and punished him immediately when he killed his brother in the first place and then forgiven him or at least uh, have visited him if he put him in prison. But he didn't do that. And uh, so here the seeds of disloyalty have a chance to grow. And uh, disloyalty it is because in chapter 15 we find the revolt of Absalom against his own father. And here Absalom becomes a type of the Antichrist. There are many uh, Old Testament uh, characters that uh, are regarded as a type of Christ, like Joseph is a type of Christ and Isaac is a type of Christ, and we said a while ago where David was a type of Christ. But there are some people in the Old Testament that are types, or we could say foreshadows, of the Antichrist. And uh, one is Absalom here because he attempts to steal the throne of David. And during the tribulation, the Antichrist will attempt to do the same thing. In fact, we're told he'll actually attempt to occupy the throne of David by building a statue in Revelation 13 in the Holy of Holies of himself and demanding that the Jews and all other uh, citizens of the world fall down and worship him. So Absalom now becomes a type of the Antichrist. And... Um, he goes to Hebron, or as we said before, Hebron. And here he announces his rebellion. He picked a very good place to do that. You see, the people of Hebron were apparently a little miffed at David. The reason being that this was his first capital. And then he moved his capital from Hebron into the city of Jerusalem. And I doubt if the people ever really forgot or forgave him for that. And uh, I'm sure that Absalom knew that. And so he goes to Hebron now, and he announces himself as the new king. And verse 13 of chapter 15, And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not escape from Absalom. Here is installment number four. The first was the death of David's son, and the second then was incest in his own family. The third was murder in his own family, and now rebellion. He's forced to flee from the city of Jerusalem because of the hateful actions of his own boy, his beloved boy, his favorite boy. Absalom. 
All right, now they return or they hide out in the wilderness, and David is accompanied by a number of loyal followers. There were two priests, and we're not sure who was the high priest at this time. Apparently, both were co-high priests. It's a rather mixed up uh, chronology record at this time. We're not sure, but one was Zadok, and the other was a fellow named Abiathar. I don't know if you remember who Abiathar was or not, but uh, some years ago when uh, Abimelech, or Abimelech, the priest at Nob, fed David some food, you remember, and then King Saul later killed 85 of those priests and all of his sons, one escaped uh, the sword of King, da- of King Saul, and that was Abiathar. And so he stuck with David throughout the years. And so Abiathar and Zadok, who was a godly priest from the line of Aaron, and uh, both these men go with David here in the wilderness, and they carry the Ark of the Covenant with them. They said, well, you know, we're going to lug this thing around, and maybe it'll bring us some luck. But David probably remembered the last time that the Ark was taken from its proper resting place. You remember that was in 1 Samuel chapter 4. And on that occasion, it was captured by the Philistines, and David just didn't want that. And uh, so David says, you return the ark back to Jerusalem. And we appreciate what he said on this occasion, verse 25 of chapter 15. The king sent unto Zadok, carry back the ark of God into the city. If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and its habitation. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here I am. Let him, let God, do to me as seemeth good unto him. What David's saying here is that, uh, look, uh, God's going to work this thing out anyway, one way or another. And uh, I'll get just what I deserve. If God decides that he wants to set me aside, then he can do that. And the Ark of the Covenant is not going to help. So they, in verse 29, therefore... Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God again to Jerusalem, and they tarried there. And then in verse 30, we have uh, a rather, oh, I don't know, how shall we say this, a very moving verse. It reminds us of something that happened in the New Testament in, in John chapter 18, and also in Luke chapter 19. Let me read it and see if you remember ever hearing of this in the New Testament. I'm referring to Second Samuel 15, verse 30. And David, he's by himself now, I suppose, went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet and wept as he went up and had his head covered and he went barefoot and all the people who were with him covered every man his tent, his head and they went up weeping as they went up. And we're also told in verse 23, Uh, before we read verse 30, and all the country wept with a loud voice and all the people passed over and the king also himself passed over the brook Kidron. So here we have the brook Kidron mentioned, we have the Mount of Olives, and we have a king who weeps. Now, some ten centuries later, one black Thursday night, if the uh, traditional chronology is correct if Christ was crucified on a Friday, and he may not have been. Some believe he was on a Wednesday. But if this be correct on a Thursday night, another king, the king of kings, the seed of David, would also cross over the brook Kidron, according to John 18. And right before that, he will have wept over the city of Jerusalem, saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that slayest the prophets, how I would have gathered you unto myself as a hen gathereth her chicks, but ye would not. And henceforth, he said, is your house left unto you desolate. And all these things in the Old Testament certainly remind us and then prepare for the ministry of the Lord Jesus in the New Testament. About that time, David learned some more bad news. There was a fellow called Ahithophel, and Ahithophel was one of David's counselors. He was sort of a saved Henry Kissinger, you see. And um, Ahithophel was also the grandfather of Queen Bathsheba. 
Apparently, he never forgave David for what he did to his granddaughter, although he never told him about that, I don't suppose, but we do know that he was the grandfather of Bathsheba. And now he turns traitor, and uh, he betrays David, and he goes over there in Jerusalem to the side of Absalom. And we're told that David hears this in verse 31. And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Well, another one of David's counselors, a very well-known man, was a man named Hushai, H-U-S-H-A-I, Hushai. And... Uh, I suppose we could also pronounce that Hushai. And uh, so Hushai, though, decided to remain with David. And he came out and said, listen, David, I want to be with you here. And David said, no, you really can't do me any good out here. I'll tell you what, if you, you can do, I can use you far better if you go back to Jerusalem and you pretend like you're going to do what Ahithophel did and uh, you pretend like you sell me out. In other words, what he wanted Hushai to do was to be a counter-spy. And so Hushai said that he would do that. And uh, so then in the next few chapters, we have the, um, the uh, counsel here of Ahithophel and also Hushai, and we'll see that uh, uh, the, uh, the young man, whose name is uh, Absalom, this rebellious young man, takes the wrong advice, much to his regret later on. But before that, a couple of things happen on this occasion. And uh, one is this, at this time, there was a descendant from the tribe of Benjamin and also from the line of Saul, whose name was Shemai. And Shemai comes out and he sees David and he curses him. He throws stones at him. He jumps up and down and probably sticks his tongue out and shakes his fist and says, you know, you dirty so-and-so, you had it coming to you and I'm glad that... Uh, You've got, uh, you're going through this. You don't deserve to be king anyway. And one of David's soldiers said, let me go over there, verse 9. He said, why should, one of the soldiers said, why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And uh, notice what David says. David says in verse 11, he said <clears throat> to all of his servants and to the soldier that wanted to do this, behold, my son... Absalom here, my son who came forth from my own body seeketh my life. He's trying to kill me. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. My own son is attempting to kill me, and I'm not going to get too excited about this little flea-bitten uh, mouse over here that's cursing me when my own beloved boy is attempting to, to kill me. Then David said, it may be, verse 12, that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requit me good for his cursing this day. All right, at the end of chapter 16, Absalom reaches the city of Jerusalem from the, land, from the city of Hebron. And the Bible says that one of the first thing he does, that he takes his father's concubines unto his own. Now, this was all prophesied that this would be done when God says after David's sin against uh, him and Bathsheba and Uriah, God says, your neighbor will take your concubine someday. This will be a part of your punishment. Of course, David did not know and could not know that that prophecy will be fulfilled in his own son, not just his neighbor, but his own son. But Ahithophel recommended that he do this. He said, now, when they see that, when the crowd sees that, and believe me, this will spread among the troops, uh, they'll realize when a man takes another man's concubines that he's going to take his place on the throne also. And that psychologically this is the, this is the thing to do. And so Absalom does this. All right, in chapter 17 we find uh, two uh, men advising um, Absalom. One is uh, Ahithophel and the other is Hushai. Ahithophel gives Absalom the right advice. And his advice is this, he says, hit him where they ain't. Right away, he said, muster a frontal attack before David could counteract his forces. He said, he's weak now, and he's disorganized. And Absalom, he said, you've got enough, and hit him real hard right now, and you, in one quick move, 
you can you can rout the army of David. And Ahithophel was right. This probably, humanly speaking, would have taken place. And uh, Absalom said, well, uh, that sounds all right, but Hushai, what do you think? And Hushai said, no, I really can't agree with, uh, with Ahithophel. I'm sure he's a sincere man, but listen, your dad is a ferocious warrior, and we all know that. And they probably shook their head, yeah, we, we got to admit that. Now listen, if you attack him now, he may whip you. Or even if he doesn't whip you, he's going to kill a lot of your men. And then the people are going to say, oh, Absalom lost a lot of troops, and they're going to just melt away from you. So what you need to do this is send out a, a, an order from Dan to Beersheba. That means uh, the uttermost north of Palestine to the uttermost parts of the south. And you gather a large army, and then you attack him, and you ought to lead it yourself. You know, And I can imagine this, of course, uh, appeal to the vain Absalom, and he pictures himself as a five-star general now. And he's seated upon a white charger, and uh, he's uh, he's taking care of the old man out there in the in the wilderness and defeating the armies of David and becoming king. And so he says, "I I think I'll do that." Well, Ahithophel felt bad about it, so he went home. The Bible says, "Put his house in order," said goodbye to his family, and hanged himself. But they should have listened to Ahithophel, for he knew what he was talking about. Of course, God had a hand in this. Not only did uh, David appealed to the vanity, or Hushai appealed to the vanity of Absalom, but God had arranged this because in chapter 17, verse 14, we read the last part of that verse, For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil, literally judgment or calamity, upon Absalom. And then in verse 25 of that chapter, we find the death, the suicidal death of Ahithophel. In chapter 18, we have the battle of Mount Ephraim, and here the uh, forces of David are met by the forces of Jonathan, and I mean, sorry, of Absalom, and uh, Absalom would soon find out that his green soldiers, probably a lot of young college kids, so to speak, were no match whatsoever for David's seasoned troops. And uh, they quickly lost nearly 20,000 men, and then they lost the entire battle. And so Absalom attempts to escape, but he's caught in some underbrush, and uh, there he is, hanging not by the hair, chapter 18, verse 14, we're told, but by his head. I heard a sermon some time ago entitled, Getting a... No, let's see, uh, that's Samson, I think I told you about that, getting a haircut in the devil's barbershop. This had something else to do, let's see. Oh, I think it was uh, hung by a hippie haircut. That's right, and supposedly Absalom was the first uh, hippie in history. Well, he apparently didn't have real long hair. Uh, we're told that he trimmed his hair, he weighed it, and uh, uh, weighed the amount of hair and everything. He may or may not have had long hair, but his head here is caught, and not his hair. So we need not necessarily accuse him of being a hippie. He was bad enough without being a hippie. And uh, now when he's caught firmly in the oak of this tree in chapter 18, verse 8, uh, that uh, Joab finds out about it. And in verse 14, we are told that Joab takes three staves. And the King James says darts, but these were not the darts that you throw at a dartboard. These were uh, little, uh, well, almost looked like darning needles, probably uh, maybe a foot long, very sharp and and uh, thick. And he took these three staves and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. Uh, David, when he pretty well realized he was going to win the battle, he told his soldiers, uh, go out there and do what you have to do, but be tender with the boy. Don't kill the boy. Don't assassinate my son. And here, bloodthirsty Joab does exactly what Joab, what he's told not to do. In chapter 18 and verse 19, we find concerning David's uh, grief, uh, actually verse 33, I suppose, of chapter 18, how David weeps over his son and the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, 
my son. And chapter 19, he's still weeping. And he says, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. And so finally, Joab enters in, and he really reproves David. He said, You're, you would think that we lost the battle instead of they. He said, we've won the battle. And he said, now you quit that crying, and you get out there and tell those troops that you're proud of them. David now starts the long trip from the wilderness back, probably crossing the Jordan River near Jericho toward the city of Jerusalem. There's a problem on the way back. At first, the tribe of Judah does, for some reason, does not want David to come back. And um, then they decide they do. And then the other ten tribes, they say, now, wait a minute, we want to make up the vanguard, as it were, and we're tired of you uh, being uh, the bigwigs as far as David is concerned. And uh, so the men of Judah said, well, he's from the tribe of Judah. We ought to have this privilege. And so the ten tribes said, forget it. We'll declare war on David and... Uh, we're not even going to come back, let David come back and be the king. In fact, there was a revolt at this time by the ten tribes led by a man from the tribe of Benjamin whose name was Sheba. And uh, God steps in then and he allows Joab to defeat Sheba or David would have never gotten back to the city of Jerusalem. And finally then the ten tribes all agree that, uh, you know, David should once again be their king. And so that David, therefore, once again returns to Jerusalem, a sadder and a wiser man. Someone has said that he would have more troubles later, but they would not include wars and rebellions. From this point on, David does not fight another war, to my knowledge. He could now burn the mortgage on his sin debt with Bathsheba. Rebellion was the fourth thing that he had to pay. By way of review, if you remember the outline that we started with concerning David, we got a lot of S's in here, David the shepherd, and then David the singer. Do you remember? Hopefully this will jog your memory as we go along. David the soldier, David the sought, and then David the sovereign, David the sinner, David the sorrowful, because of his sin and because of the death of his uh, boy Absalom rebellion. And then David the statesman. In 2 Samuel chapter 21, David commits his, well, let's see. I probably won't get into that now. I'm going to let you read that yourself. Uh, he makes uh, some type of uh, league and agreement with some Gibeonites there. And apparently Saul had offended the Gibeonites and and God was allowing a plague to come on Israel because of that. And so David, in some uh, shuttle diplomacy of his own, uh, he brings about the peace again. And we find that in chapter 21. And that's why I've entitled this David the Statesman. And uh, in Second Samuel chapter 24, we do want to call this to your attention, David the Statistician. And we're told that uh, David determines here that he's going to number the people of Israel. And often they number the people of Israel, but God had told him not to do it. God says, I don't want you to do it. You read this in First Chronicles 21, because then you'll depend upon me and uh, you'll depend upon the troops and the number and you won't depend upon me. But David deliberately disobeys God. And the Bible says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and uh, he has to punish David because David went ahead and, and uh, you know, numbered the people regardless. Very interesting how <clears throat> 1 Chronicles 21 uh, relates this story. By the way, 1 and 2 Chronicle is, uh, gives us uh, a similar account of those events that we find in 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings. But there's a little difference. 1 and 2 uh, Chronicles tell it as God sees it. And First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings tell the story at that time as man sees it. Now, not that these books are not inspired, they are. But sometimes you read things in First Chronicles that you will not read in Second Samuel about the life of David. And here's an example. 
In 2 Samuel chapter 24, if you read it, you simply get the idea that David decided, because of his own sinfulness and stubbornness of heart, I'm going to number the children of Israel. And he does. But in 1 Chronicle 21, verse 1, that speaks of the same event, the Bible says, And Satan stood up and tempted David to number the children of Israel. Well, of course, both counts are correct. But what we're saying is that here in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, that the divine account adds something extra that we do not read in the account here in 2 Samuel. That's why it's important to read both these passages of the Scripture, and uh, you'll have this in your notes. Well, uh, a plague then, finally, our uh, God decides it's going to have to punish the uh, city of Jerusalem and also David because of this sin on his part. David repents, and he's ordered by, offered by God one of three kinds of punishment. God says, all right, I'll, do, I'll uh, allow you to pick your own punishment. You can have seven years of famine, or you can flee 90 days before your enemies, or a three-day pestilence. What will it be? Well, David chooses the latter. And as a result, uh, thousands of men die, again because of David's sin. Well, this plague was stopped here in first or Second Samuel 24. It was stopped by David at a threshing floor as he pleads with God's death angel. He sees the death angel, and so he buys this uh, floor later on and pleads with, with the death angel to stop, and the plague is ended. Now, I want to read in your hearing some of the most beautiful verses in all the Bible. And I suppose I was saved for many years before I even realized that it was there because I never got into First Chronicles and read anything. I sort of skipped over First and Second Chronicles. The first nine or ten chapters of First Chronicles scared me, I guess. I, I saw that it was a bushel full of begets, it looked like. Such and such begets, such and such you beget, such and such. But later on, when we come to the genealogy of Christ, we're going to see that uh, there's gold in them bar hills. And believe me, some of the most precious truths in all the Word of God are found in these genealogies. And don't skip over them. You may have to study them and read books on them, but don't skip over them. But at any rate, in First Chronicles chapter 29, we have the prayer of dedication at uh, the time when David now uh, gets all the material ready to build the temple. You see, God said, you can't build it. And David said, that's all right. He told me I couldn't build it, but he didn't say I couldn't prepare for it. And so he does a fantastic amount of things in order to prepare for it. All Solomon had to do was just put it all together. David's now 70. And of course, when he was but 37, he determined to build a temple for God. And now He's uh, leading in the preparations of the temple, which Solomon will later construct. David makes the following preparations. He prepares the blocks of squared stone that will be used later in the temple. He uh, gathers great quantities of iron for the temple nails, a huge supply of cedar logs. He gathers three million dollars in gold bullion and two millions of dollars worth of silver. He appoints 24,000 Levites to supervise the temple work and uh, 6,000 Levites to be the temple bailiffs and the temple judges, 4,000 Levites to act as temple guards, and he appoints 4,000 Levite musicians to head up the praise service, and then also he reappoints this special temple choir of 288 skilled singers. Then David calls for a special dedicatory service, and he does the following things. Number one, he hands over the temple blueprint to Solomon, which plans, we're told, in First Chronicles 28, he received directly from God's hand. Now, I didn't realize that until I read First Chronicles, but uh, this was given in a similar way that uh, years ago, Moses received the plans from the hand of God to build the tabernacle. God drew up the blueprints and gave them to Moses, and uh, I just assumed that uh, they just took those plans and sort of, you know, modified them for the temple here. But God himself gave the blueprints, according to First Chronicle 28, for the temple. And uh, he gave it to David, and David now gives it to Solomon. Well, continuing on what David did, 
he personally contributes to the work of an offering totaling $85 million of gold and $20 million of silver. He must have burned or he must have melted down every uh, golden uh, cufflink that he had to give this much offering to the Lord. Of course, as a king, he would have millions of dollars at his disposal anyway. And then his action, when he gives all this gold and silver, it immediately prompted Israel's leaders to pledge $145 million in gold, 50000 in foreign currency, three, uh, $30 million in silver, and 800 tons of bronze, and 4,600 tons of silver, in addition to great amounts of jewelry in chapter 29. So the total amount of David's preparation must have exceeding exceeded over 200 million. And then at this time, he offers, I believe, one of the most beautiful prayers in all the Bible. And I want to read that to you at this dedication service uh, before, of course, the temple actually starts going up. Wherefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our father forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in thine, the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. My, what beautiful words. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I and what are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding." O oh, Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build an house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand and is all thine own. I know also, my God, that thou testest the heart and hath pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now I have seen with joy thy people who are present here offer willingly unto thee. This is one of the final recorded things that he does. And we're told that shortly after this, after he dedicates the preparation for the temple here, he uh, writes one of his first psalms, perhaps. Um, some believe that this is maybe the very first one. We don't know. It's, it's almost identical with Psalm 18 at, at any rate. And David spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hands of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And David said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. And then in chapter 23, David's last prophetic words. Now these are the last words of David, the son of Jesse, and uh, said, And the man who was raised up on high, and the anointed of God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. This is what he said. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Now, this speaks uh, of the plenary verbal inspiration of the Scripture. The word plenary means all. The word verbal is the words. And here is David saying, that God's Holy Spirit directed me to write those words that I wrote. Apparently here is referring to the Psalms. Notice verse 3. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And uh, here David goes on now and gives his final prophetic testimony. And he's approaching 70 now. And this will bring to an end the life of David, perhaps the greatest man that ever lived. All right, uh, we'll just introduce the subject of Solomon, and then we'll complete his life in another lecture. Perhaps I 
now should one more time go over the life of David because it is so important through this outline that we have here. See if you can think your way through each of this class. David the shepherd, <coughs> when he took care of his father's sheep. David the singer, that ought to jog your memory in the place when, <coughs> excuse me, the time when he came uh, to Saul's palace and sung. David the soldier, that would be David and Goliath. David the sought, when he hides from Saul. David the sovereign, remember he's anointed to Hebron uh, when he's 30, and uh, then Hebron when he's 37, the first time by two tribes, the last time by all ten. David the sovereign, David the sinner, Second Samuel 11, when he sins guilty with Bathsheba. David the sorrowful, because of his sin and because of the fourfold punishment. David the statesman, how he averts a civil war or a real touchy situation with the Gibeonites by doing something very politically motivated. And then David the statistician in Second Samuel, Samuel chapter 24 when he numbers the children of Israel and he shouldn't. David the sponsor, and this is when he led the uh, children of Israel into gathering millions of dollars worth of booty and material in order to build the temple. Then David the scribe. David was author of at least 75, and some have seen 77 of the Psalms. During this time, the book of Psalms were written, and the book of Proverbs, and the book of Ecclesiastes, and then the Song of Solomon. And a number believe, as it said, that David perhaps wrote half of these Psalms. Now, concerning Solomon, Israel's fabulous king. I'll just give you the outline, and this will be the conclusion of this message. Uh, De uh, Solomon's triumph over his enemies. There was at least four men he had to triumph over before he could become king. His triumph over his enemies. His talent from God. That would be his wisdom that God gave him. His tranquil reign over Israel. We're going to compare that reign to the reign of Christ. His temple of worship, he built what the Jews call the second temple today. <clears throat> I'm sorry, they call it the first temple. They don't include the tabernacle, but they speak of the second temple and the first temple. The first temple was the one that Solomon built, and the second temple uh, was uh, later on uh, the temple of Herod, destroyed in the days of, of uh, Titus. So his temple worship, and in that we'll see the preparation for this temple, the dedication, the supplication, and the benediction, the manifestation of the temple, and finally the presentation of the temple to the people. So he's triumph over his enemies, his talent from God, his tranquil reign over Israel, his temple of worship, his treasury of riches, his testimony throughout the land, and finally his transgressions against God. Uh, these uh, seven areas will be covered concerning Solomon's life in the next lecture. God bless you.